Hi everybody, welcome to Dulce America. My name is Bing Futch, thank you for joining me. I'm gonna do something a little different today, something I've never done on the show over the past 14 years, and it's gonna to be to show you how I arrange a piece of music. Now one of my patrons on Patreon uh, requested that I do an arrangement of the wonderful tune Shenandoah, just a fabulous, fabulous classic old song. And um, I said, okay, and I've got a version of it for DAA tuning, but I don't have one for DAD. And I love both tunings, but you know, DAA has a very, very special ability to give us nice, rich uh, chords, nice voicings, root position voicings. And then DAD gives us the ability to do a lot of inversions, you know, taking chords and flipping them over, which gives us a lot more options when it comes down to arranging music. So um, I'm just going to kind of walk through this. And uh, before we get started, I just want to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that you can do to create your own arrangement. Now, I know a lot of people go onto the Internet and they are looking, searching for tablature for their favorite tunes. And I always tell people at festivals, and uh, a lot of instructors hate when I say this, but I'll have to say it. I really don't want you to have to buy my book of tablature. In fact, my goal is to make sure that you never have to buy another book of tablature again or go searching for your favorite tab because the world's best song collection is not on the internet somewhere. It's here and it's here. It's the stuff that you love, tunes you know by heart. And that's part of the key of being able to do your own arrangements. You need to be able to hear it first and then be able to find those notes and those chords on the dulcimer. That's kind of hard to do with songs that you're just now learning or songs that you don't know at all. But if that song is something that you've loved for a very, very long time, it only takes a few little steps to be able to find it on the dulcimer, make your own arrangements, and then put it all together. So I'm going to take you through the whole thing. I have no idea how long this is going to take. Um, and I'll be murmuring a lot to myself and trying to let you know what I'm doing as I go from place to place. One thing I will point out again, uh, not again, but one thing I'll point out here that'll help you quite a bit in creating your own arrangements is to train your ear to the sound of intervals. That's the distance between two notes. And in the chromatic scale, we've got a number of intervals, all with different characters, all with different names, and all with different functions in terms of melody inside of a scale, and also in terms of chords. So one of the best apps out there is called Better Ears, and I'll put the link for it up here. Uh, there's a desktop version and there's a mobile device version for iOS and for Android. It is an amazing application that trains you not only in interval ear training, but also pitch recognition, uh, key signature and time signature recognition, chords, scales. Uh, it really is wonderful. And one of the best things about this app, I don't get paid by better ears for any of this. I'm just offering this information to you because it's helped me quite a bit in my music theory study. Uh, one of the best thing it does is it uh, keeps track of your progress. So you can look at how you scored on all these different things and you know what to work on. And that is invaluable feedback that will help you to dial in and work on the areas that require the most effort. So my version of uh, Shenandoah is going to be based off of the wonderful version recorded by the Statler Brothers off their album, The Statler Brothers Sing the Hits from 1967. I love it. Uh, I think it was the first version of Shenandoah I ever heard. And what these guys do with it is it's 4-4 in, it's four, four time, but they put sort of a calypso rhythm behind it, even though the arrangement sounds very Latin. Uh, it's got this 1-2-3-1-2-3-1-2-1-2-3-1-2-3-1-2. And we'll talk about that more and how to incorporate that. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Right now, I have to find the melody. And so I'll start here, and I want to keep that melody on the melody string as much as possible. It's going to help me to keep the melody as the highest pitch note in the chord when I start piecing things together. So uh, first note is going to be on the middle string A, and then I got an open on the melody string D. And when I talk about the interval stuff, uh, being able to recognize intervals is going to help you when you hear a tune in your head, then get down on the fretboard and you'll know how far you need to go to the next note. And it really helps visually and it helps by hearing. So some of this may look like I already know the tune. 
but I'm really just using the intervals to help me kind of go from place to place. So far, so good. Okay, so we've got the melody. Now, as I mentioned uh, before, the secret to playing chord melody style on the dulcimer, or any instrument for that matter, is you want to keep the melody as the highest pitch note in the chord. And the dulcimer has just enough strings to play a triad. So all we're doing when we're doing the arranging is to find the melody first and foremost. That's the most important part of the tune. And then every time we've got that spot, wherever we are at on the fretboard, we're then going to add two other notes to it to make the full chord. So we're looking for a note on the middle string and a note on the bass string. Now there are a couple of times, as you can see here, I'm going over to the middle string, and I may have to do that anyway to get the right voicing of the chord, where the pitches are, are, are arranged in, in, the, in the manner that's going to serve the song the best. Now I know right now um, that the version of the tune, the Statler Brothers uh, version in my head, does a key change. It's a half step key change and that's kind of difficult to do on a diatonic mountain dulcimer. So I tend to make uh, key changes that are a little wider but nonetheless uh, we are uh, moving, we're, we're, we're modulating. So I'm in the key of D right now, this is DAD tuning by the way, and uh, it's pretty easy and it sounds good to go from the key of D to the key of G. So now I'm going to find that melody but I'm going to find it in the key of G starting from the third fret. So before I went open on the middle and then open on the melody. So I'm gonna do the same thing here, but I'm gonna be pressing down the third fret. Going way up here. Nope. There we go. There it is. Going to that middle string again. I could go, I could go open here, but I have a feeling that since I'm going to be playing a G major chord at that point, that I need to go to the middle. Okay. Back down here. Actually, maybe. There it is. All right, and again, I'll probably make some changes to that based on the the kind of chord I'm using, whether it's a first inversion or a second inversion chord. Um, okay, we got melody. The next step now is to add in the other two notes of the chord wherever we're going. So. Real quick, say we're in the key of D as we start off, and we have a D major scale. Uh, there are two sharps in the key, F sharp and C sharp, and our seven notes, our seven different notes, are D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, and C sharp. Of course, the octave D at the top gives us our eighth note. So out of those seven notes of the scale, you can also build chords off of each one that result in three major chords, three minor chords, and one diminished chord. By using these melodies together and also the chords, we're playing diatonically. We're, we're staying inside the key. And you can listen to a song and pretty much tell if it's staying in the key or if it's borrowing chords and melody notes from another key. This one's really straightforward, and I know it's staying diatonic. So my chord choices here are going to be D major, G major, and A major. Those are the major chords. 
uh, E minor, F sharp minor, and B minor are my minor chords, and C sharp diminished is going to be my diminished chord. So with that in mind, if I know where all those chords are located, it's going to help me a lot as I strike start trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's why it's always important to know where all of these different iterations of chords are on your fretboard using our three basic chord shapes, the slant, the extended slant, and the L shape, as well as the bar, which is a root five chord, a chord that only features the root and the five, does not contain the major or minor third. So that bar can be used as either a major or a minor chord if you need to use that for whatever reason. So I'm going to start off here. I know I'm starting off with D major as the chord, so I can play open here. That works nicely because I'm playing that melody string for the melody, and then the other guys back here are droning. Now the first time through when I play this as an arrangement, I'll probably do it with the drone. I'll probably take the song around twice in the key of D, and then make the modulation jump to G, and, and then play it a third time and then end it, uh, you know, as a performance piece or as a recorded piece. But, um, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, the first time through, I'm just going to play it against the drone. I won't do the whole thing, but, oh, yeah, I'll do the whole thing. I'll play it against the drone, because that's the old school traditional way. But as I'm playing along, listen, because what we're trying to do here is, most people, or songwriters, follow this sort of rule where, if the melody is uh, sustaining for a, for a while, then the melody should be part of the chord that is supporting it so that there are no clashes, so we don't have any uh, dissonance in there. I call them lily pad chords. So if I, if I wanted to have that D major hanging out for a long time and the melody was hanging out for a long time, I'd want to have one, that, one of the notes inside the chord as that melody, either D, F sharp, or A. If you use a tone that's not inside of the chord, it could create a little bit of tension and some clashing there. So what I want you to listen for is, as the melody is moving along with the drone, which is A and D, partially a D major, listen for where the note sounds like it's not quite happy to be there. And that typically means that that's the time when the chord has changed. I'll acknowledge it the first time it happens and then let you know that when you hear this, then here's some of the stuff that you can do to, to figure out what that chord might be if you don't already know. So. So right there, even though we're not hanging out there for a long time, I'm playing B and B is not in a D major chord but that's giving me a hint. I also happen to know that that right there is when we're hitting G major. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking for here. Actually, no, we haven't gone to G yet. When we come back to B, that note is going to be sustaining for a while, and that is where we're actually making the change to G. So let me do that again. That's the note that's sustaining, and that's an A. That's fine, that's the perfect fifth of a D major chord, so we're all good there. Now that note is hanging out for a while, and it's not working with D major, but B is the major third of G major, so if we just go ahead and do that, everything is fine. So I'll keep moving here. know coming back that we're going to make that G. Sorry. Okay, those sound good. One, two, so I'm going to be hanging out there for a couple of beats. Okay, so what's that E? E's not part of a D major chord. It sounds kind of cool, but it's not quite resolved. So that's going to be a change right there, and it's going to be an interesting one now that I can look at it, because uh, the feeling I get is we need to go to B minor at that point, but E is not a part of B minor either, but it's not going to stay there too long. It is going to resolve down to D. So I'm filing that away to think about what I might be doing with that later.
Now, also what I know about this tune is that uh, it's a minor chord that happens right here. So you could use D and leave it, but the A can be a part of a minor chord that's going to make that very dramatic. And um, one of the things I really like about the Statler Brothers version, it's full of drama. It's great. So uh, I have a feeling I know what's going to happen here. Right there, I can see that there's something that we're going to have to change. Probably go to A. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do that with the uh, modulation because everything's going to sound wrong with a D drone since we're going to uh, G major. So I just wanted to float through that real quick. Now, let's go ahead and start piecing together some of these chords. Okay, we decided right here with this B, we're going to go ahead and put a G major in there. So, I have a couple of options. I can do an L-shaped chord, 3-3-5, three, three, that'll keep that melody right where it is. I'm just going to bring in these two. Or, I can use the melody and piece in a slant G major. Now my personal preference is that I would use the L shape. Why is that? Well here, this G major, the root of the chord, the emphasis on the root of the name of the chord is on the middle string and it's a little high. It doesn't really have enough, you know, support. But this L shape has this nice low G that anchors the chord and provides a lot of low support for it. And that's what I'm going to go with, is the L shape. It's going to hold that G for a while, so I'm going to continue working with my melody. Okay, now the next thing that happens here is this. You can tell right there that the F sharp on the melody string is not quite working with that G. It's a little shiny. It, it's a little restless. Now, um, I could do a number of things. F sharp, I could go back to D if I wanted to. And that sounds great, right? But the Statler Brothers version, drama. They actually take it to a minor, and the minor they use is F sharp minor. So... Now it's going to go hanging out on that B. I believe we're going back to G. Now here's something that's also important. Trying to figure out when those chords are changing and then what that chord might be. How can you figure that out if you're listening to the original piece of music? One of the things I like to do is to listen to the lowest pitch note that I can hear. Listen to whoever's playing that note, whether it be the bass or if it's not a full arrangement, listen to the lowest note that the guitar or the mandolin or whatever is playing. And what that typically means, usually, usually, is that's going to be the root. Not always, because we can always switch the bass to be something other than the root of the chord. But I find that oftentimes the root of the chord is, uh, is accentuated. So if you're listening to this chord movement, you don't have to really hum, and you can't hum all three notes unless you're a two and throat singer. But if you hear the movement going, um, bum, 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 and that low note is continuously kind of moving around, follow that note and then match that movement on your fretboard. And that'll give you another key, not only the melody, but the lowest note may give you a really good clue as to what the root of the chord is. And then you could kind of triangulate that plus the remaining string and, and find out what your chord might be. And that's really important when it comes to stuff like this, where we go... Um, coming back up to G. Okay, in the Statler Brothers piece, the bass goes... Um, it rises up, which takes us to A. OK, 
Okay, so from the F sharp minor. Okay, and then now, before I did this, but now my fingers are busy with this bar for the A that we've reached momentarily. And the only way I can grab the F sharp now is either to reach down there with my ring finger and grab it on the melody string, which is kind of uncomfortable if I don't need to do it, or I can grab the F sharp on the middle string at the fifth fret. And that's a lot easier, it's right within my reach there. The thumb's not even busy doing anything, so I can do there, so. Going back to the melody string for that A. Okay, now the next note is gonna be E and then D. So, uh, E and I'm hearing this song in my head and there's another minor chord there. I remember earlier I was saying it's probably B minor. It's B, D, F sharp. So that's not a B minor chord right there. What we've got here is a B minor, but we've added this melody note at E at the first fret on the melody string. It's only there very temporarily. So I can hit that and then let go of the one. And there we have our B minor proper. It's kind of nice. Recording, I hear the bass go up a half step. Um, we're back to G. away. So I'm going to let go of this. I'm bound away. Too high. Now once again, going to that A, it works fine with D major, but you know what I'm going to say. Drama. Let's go back to that F sharp minor instead. So delicious. In my head, I hear the bass go up another half step. Um, okay, now my next note would be D. I could pick the middle. Okay, that's easier because my fingers are already at the third fret barring. Okay, so the next note up is going to be right there at the fourth fret middle string, using my thumb to get that. Next note is F sharp going down. We're going back into our minor, so I'm going to bar at the second fret. That's going to give me my support for F sharp minor. It's also giving me my melody, which is F sharp. Coming up to the third fret to get that D on the uh, middle string with my thumb. Missouri. Okay, that's E going down to D, so I can go Ah, okay. So to G, the four chord, going to the five chord, and then back to one. Okay, and that's a kind of a, a standard progression uh, to end a piece. And technically that could be the end of the tune, but we're gonna keep moving. So what I did there was sussed out that we're doing the major and I inverted what would, uh, and this is where things get interesting and you'll run into this a lot. Typically that is a G major, three, one, zero. Got G, we've got B, and we've got D on the open string. It's an extended slant G major chord. What I've done is I've put the melody note in there, that's E. Much like I did with that B minor down there, I added this note. But what you might be interested to find out if you just flip this over is that we've got an E minor chord, E, G, and B, and we're flipping it over. So why does that work? This is basically an E minor, not a G. 
but we've got this E that we've put into the picture. It's not the bass, it's not the lowest pitch note in the chord, it's not the root necessarily anymore. If we play it like this, it becomes a G major with a little E as a melody, but in actuality, it really is an E minor chord with the pitches rearranged. So why does that work so well? Well, because G major has a relative minor chord, it's E minor, both of those uh, chords share two notes, so they work really well as a chord substitution. D to B minor, A to F sharp minor, both of those are, uh, or those pairs are examples of the relative major and relative minor chords, and each key has them, and it works out real nice. It's just a different voicing of the chord. So I'm gonna go from that G with the E melody, and then I'm just going to shift these two up and leave that note there, and I've got my A major. E is the perfect fifth of A major, so it is a consonant. It works fine. And then I can let go of the whole thing and go back to D. All right, so let me go back and uh, play that whole thing there. So I like that, but I know I can do a little better as far as harmony. Even though we've got our open strum, which we can use as a D major chord, again, we're tuned D, A, D, and a D major chord is D, F sharp, A. It's that middle third, the major third, that makes it a complete chord. We could play that as zero, zero, two. And there's the whole chord. So that's a root five chord. I'd like to put a bit more harmony in there. I mean, this isn't a Statler Brothers arrangement after all. So put a little bit more harmony in there. So instead of just playing that open, I'm gonna go ahead and play a two, three, four, and make sure I can get that F sharp in there. Now I'm playing F sharp as the bass, and that works just fine with a D major chord. Uh, we would call that a slash chord, D slash F sharp, and that is a first inversion, which means we're taking the third of the chord and we're putting it on the bottom of the chord. And it sounds real nice there, so. Nice. Now this craziness, um, I do not have the fingers of Tall Glazner. I do not have the hands of Mr. Tall. Um, but I, I do go for those big stretches and I want to hold on to those two notes. So I'm gonna come up with my thumb and grab those two notes there, D and C sharp, and walk it down into my G. When I make this tablature, I'm gonna give my uh, patrons the option of not doing that. And it's a lot easier if you just don't complete that, add the harmony into that D major. But my choice is I'm gonna go ahead and suffer for my art for a couple of beats because I really wanna hold on to that, that color while I reach up and grab these notes. our G major, F sharp minor, gonna walk it up to A, to our B minor with the E, gonna let go of the E, go down to D, and then I'm gonna raise that bass up from F sharp to G major. I'm gonna lift up my index and go down to A for my pickup note, back into the refrain melody string. Ah, it's so sweet, I love that movement. Okay, gonna come up from F sharp to G again. Pick the middle. Bar at the second fret. Come up to the D on the middle string. And we'll do our inverted E minor, which is serving as a G major with an E as the melody. A, and, boom. All right. So we've got um, our melody and we've got our chords for the first part of the tune. Now we're gonna do a modulation and we're gonna take it up to G major. So this involves different chords and a few of the same chords, but we're also gonna be in a different region of the fretboard. So far, everything we've done here has been in the first octave, from open to the seventh fret. Now we're gonna go from the third fret to the 10th fret because our G major scale is here. So we're gonna be finding a lot of activity that's gonna take us up here, and we won't be using the chord shapes that are down here. 
So we're changing keys without using a capo, which is awesome. All right, so we're in a bar at the third fret, and we're gonna start things off here. Now, I have to get up there to E. Now this is ridiculous. That's just plainly ridiculous. And I wouldn't put myself through that, even for a couple of beats for my art. So what do I wanna do here? What I wanna do is I wanna do something called chasing the melody. At least I call it chasing the melody. Basically, you've got all these different versions of G major that you can play, all the chords, you've got different versions of them that you can play. So if you are trying to hang on and give support to the melody that requires a G major, but that melody begins to run away and you're having a hard time holding down the fort, then just move to another chord shape. So this is interesting. Um, let me do this. My target note is here. It's going to be E. I know this is a G major chord right here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do this. Sound familiar? Yes, it is actually technically an E minor that I'm playing there. But it's also a first inversion E minor where we have got the, uh, we've got the uh, third of the chord on the root. And in this case, Yes, it's B. So we got the third of the chord as the root. The first inversion chords on the mountain dulcimer have a lot of space in them due to the incredible spectrum that we've got from the bass string to the melody string. There's a full octave between those two notes. And first inversion chords tend to have real big gaps in them because we've got the third on the bottom, we've got the root here, and then we've got the fifth at the top. For that reason, they can be a little indistinct, and that's exactly what we need right here because we actually want it to be a major chord but the reach is making it very difficult to, to make that happen with a nice solid L shape so that it's indistinct is good we're not there very long and that E is going to come down to D pretty quickly so for a couple of beats it doesn't matter just a little extra color there and then we, we move on so I think that's going to work Okay, here comes another stretch, but I'm higher up on the fretboard where the frets are closer together, so this shouldn't be too bad. Good. All right, here's our target note back to E, and we're going to do a C major chord, L-shaped chord there. So while I'm doing this, there's a couple of things in, the, in this key change. One, I already know what chords I'm using down below here, and those chords can be translated into scale degrees. So whatever I did here, I know that it's going to work in a different key using the same movement. So I knew I was going uh, to the four chord in G major. That's G is the, is the one chord, uh, C is the four chord, and D is the five chord. So I know that C and D are going to play a big part in, uh, in this, just like uh, G and A are the four chord and the five chord for the key of D, and they played a big part down here as well. So I was kind of prepared for that. Another way of going about it is to look at your fingers and the relationship between the frets, the nut, and all that stuff, the shapes, the different wide spaces, and narrow spaces that we have, the whole steps and the half steps that we have, and then just match those to the patterns in this upper octave. And even if you don't know what the note or the chord is, by following those patterns visually, you can pull out the same chord movement and progressions and you don't have to know exactly what you're playing as long as it sounds good to your ears. So it's a mixture of those things that you can use here. So we've gone. Okay, we know I'm going down to this B. So we've got B minor here. Gonna come up to G, uh, sorry, C. Okay, comes up one more to D. I'm coming up on the middle string now instead of going over on the melody string because I'm in that bar like I was before. 
So that's um, picking the A7, sorry, the eighth fret on the middle string and then picking the melody string, and I'm barred with all three fingers across there. Same thing as we had that B minor down there. Coming up. Now let's see, away. Now that's not too bad of a reach all of a sudden. I think I'll suffer down into B minor, coming up a half step, middle string down to B, going to come up one little half step here, and then remember I'm going for that big four or five finish, so there's C major with the uh, A as the melody. Then I'm gonna move this up like this to D major. And then wrap it up with the bar three for G major. All right, we've got melody and chords for the key change. Awesome. So at this stage of the game, typically when I found, and normally when you get to this part, it's like, oh, didn't have to fake anything, didn't have to bend any notes, uh, you know, didn't have to fake any chords or do any substitutions that weren't, you know, on the, on the menu. So now we've got the melody and we have got the chords. Now it's time to sort of put a spin on it and, and put a bit of an arrangement to it and figure out what we're going to do. Again, this, uh, you know, of course I can't post it here without getting docked by YouTube, uh, but listen to that recording of Shenandoah by the Statler Brothers. And you'll hear all this really lovely guitar work and some keyboard work that sound like little chimes. And it's got kind of a Latin feel. But really, that stands out. What propels the, the motion of this tune quite a bit is this kind of calypso rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. It doesn't sound calypso in the arrangement but the movement and the pulse and the meter, and we just talked about meter, the meter's there. The strong beats and the weak beats have got this one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. And so I love that. So I'm going to try and emulate that as much as possible and do so on the bass string and on the middle string and leave the melody string alone. And I'm really only going to do that rhythm part when the melody is sustaining for a beat and a half or two beats that's where the melody needs assistance. Other than that, you know, when the melody kind of chills out, I'm going to be over here kind of going... You know, something like that. So, um, also, there's all kinds of little flourishes throughout the arrangement of theirs, and I'm thinking I could do something like that for the opening. I won't do it exactly like it. Um, but for the opening, I may do something like um,
key change. Nope, I don't like that. Uh, let me see. Hmm. I know I want to go there. Ah. To D? No, no, to C. And there we've got a little bit of a... Uh, an arrangement point to the end of the piece that sort of bookends what I started off with in the very, very beginning. And there it is. That's, uh, there's a rough, uh, a rough version of uh, Shenandoah based on the recording by the Statler Brothers from 1967. The Statler Brothers sing the hits. Now I'm going to go back over that. I'm going to polish it up a little bit, figure out some other things that I can do rhythmically, maybe some other kind of uh, harmony flourishes. And uh, once I play it, and once I get to the point where I can play it several times uh, without changing anything, then I'll feel like maybe it's a an arrangement that holds some water. And I'll go ahead and I'll uh, put it down on paper, and I will serve it up to my patrons and start teaching it at some point at a festival in the future. So once again, you can do this. All you have to do is uh, train your ear to be able to listen to the distance between notes, the intervals. Uh, Better Ears is a great training app for the, doing that exact thing. There are lots of interval ear trainers for free on the web, but I think what really makes Better Ears uh, awesome is that it keeps track of your score. And you can reset that score whenever you want to in case you like totally suck at it and you're like, okay, let's start over again. Uh, but it keeps track of the score and valuable information so you can dive in and look at what you need to work on the most. When I first started working on intervals, I was really um, having a, a hard time with my minor sixes and my major sixes. And so I went back and just drilled my minor and major sixes and then was able to get better uh, scoring on that after a while. Listen to a piece of music and follow the bass line. Follow the lowest note you can hear in the chord. That will oftentimes let you know when the chord is changing and you can, if you can find that note on the instrument, it'll let you know what the root of that chord is. If you already know what your melody is and if you already know what the root of the chord is, then you only have to find that one note in the middle to piece everything together. Keep your melody as the highest pitched note in the chord. That way it'll stand out and pop and the other two notes will uh, support that melody. And the chord melody style means you can play full chords without having to put too much accent on the melody to make it stand out. And that's it. Have fun with it. Start off with something simple, work up, and not everything is going to flow this smoothly. Again, this is a tune that's very, very simple. If you're trying to do something a bit more complex, like Let It Go from Frozen, your ear will listen to that and tell you that there is a lot of accidentals notes that are not supposed to be in the key. A lot of borrowed chords, and that gets difficult on the mountain dulcimer. There are ways to sort of make it happen, but if you want it to sound anything like the original, you, you either have to uh, be very, very crafty with bending notes and omitting chords, or you just have to get a chromatic dulcimer. Sometimes you might have a song where it's just one note or one chord that you're missing, and there are ways to get crafty uh, to get those included in there. And I think I will do something like that coming up soon as another part of our ongoing series of studies here for Music Theory on the Mountain Dulcimer. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Once again, thank you to my patrons on Patreon for making Dulcimerica possible for the past 14 years. And we'll see you next week. Who knows what we're going to do. Take care, everybody.